Hello everyone, this is another segment of SAR Artists Live. We'll be talking with Monica Silva Lovato, who is one of the uh, co-curators of the exhibition Grounded in Clay, which is on view at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. Hello. Hello. That was so quick. I think you were the quickest artist to join this program, so. Thanks I was getting that. Like, kind of nervous, like, oh, I gotta get there. I gotta be on time. <laughs> I know. I always post up like five to ten minutes before and just kind of wait around. So I'm glad we can get started right away. Yeah. Um, I guess I will jump right into the introductions. Um, for those who are just joining now, my name is Emily Santanam. Um, I was a former Anne Ray intern at the School for Advanced Research, and I'm currently curatorial assistant at the Harvard Museum of Art up in Taos, New Mexico. Um, tonight, I'm speaking from the occupied indigenous land we call Taos, uh, which is the unceded ancestral territories of the Pueblo, Diné, and Apache peoples. Um, just for those in the audience, this is actually our final segment of the SAR Artist Live series for the year. Um, and this season we've been exploring the exhibition Grounded in Clay, the Spirit of Pueblo Pottery. Um, and it was curated by the Native American communities it represents, um, specifically the Pueblo Pottery Collective, uh, which is a group of over 60 individuals, including Monica, uh, who come from 21 different tribal communities. Um, and each individual selected and wrote about pieces um, from two significant Pueblo Pottery collections. Um, that's the Indian Arts Research Center at SAR in Santa Fe and the Vilcek Foundation in New York City. Um, and one quick note before we begin, um, this program is partially funded by the City of Santa Fe Arts and Culture Department and the 1% Lodgers Tax. So with all of that out of the way, uh, I'd like to introduce our guest for the evening. Um, we are very lucky to be joined by uh, Monica, who I'll go ahead and introduce now. Monica Silva Lovato is a fourth generation traditional potter and a third generation silversmith from the pueblos of San Felipe and Santo Domingo or Kewa. A multimedia artist, she focuses on traditional pottery integrated with silver work to create custom contemporary pieces. Her work explores the concept of trace and the connections across generations as she aims to begin conversations that will support young potters on their own journey. She's currently pursuing a BFA in studio arts with an emphasis in ceramics uh, at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. So now that I gave that very formal introduction of you, um, would you like to maybe introduce yourself in your own words and tell us where you're joining us from? Sure. So my name is Monica Silva Lovato. I am currently in my home studio in San Felipe Pueblo. Um, like my like my bio says, I'm a fourth generation traditional potter and third generation metalsmith. Um, it's something that's been passed down through my family lines. So the the base of my work, um, I work in the lens of biography a lot, and I have my work has a lot to do with like semiotics. And so when we're talking about trace and the deposits of identity is really what you're talking about. It's everything that's left behind from our ancestors. And because I focus most of my work on this multi-generational knowledge, um, it really explores the fundamental interdependencies of those relationships. So it's not just like the work between me and my father or me and another living artist. It's everything we get from the ancestors whose pots we have in the collections when we get to go and see them and touch them and feel them and we get to learn from those art, learn from those potters those artists that came before us maybe in not necessarily the traditional master apprentice way but it's about making those connections and kind of going with it and feeling that and learning that knowledge um, so it's it's been a very interesting working with the collective and I've really enjoyed it um, getting to, to just be in the room with everybody when we're all together in like our little community events and just having that collective knowledge and everybody's knowledge is kind of the same but it's all so significantly different based on 
who who taught them or how they were taught or at what point in their life were they ready to accept that knowledge mm -hmm. and so a lot of my work is it focuses on that that's lovely that's amazing um i was actually going to ask you about that whole concept of trace um within your body of work but you already touched on it a little bit so thank you for doing that yeah um, it's usually one of the first questions i get asked like what's trace and a lot of the time it's finding the right words with trying to when when i'm explaining it it's one of the i didn't know, know about trace until last fall i took a class at ia and the class it was it was such a great course it was a senior level course and i at the time i was still at sophomore level but based on my background i was allowed to take it and that was one of the main concepts that we focused on in that course and it's been kind of eye-opening it gave me a way to express everything that i've been feeling thinking of in my work uh and it was just having the words to express that was one of the best things that i've been able to do and so i always tend to fall back onto trace but i also work within like biography and i ha i personally like to do a lot of things that work with like maker's hands or just the small little differences in each potter and how that affects our work or our shapes or like within my work i tend to fall back on my grandmother's work so i'll go and visit the collections and she has uh, she has a couple of pieces in um uh, the the vault and but two of my favorites she has a uh, their, their little chicken dishes yeah. And those two uh, pieces in particular, I can tell the difference, like in the size of her hand versus the size of my hand, just be, just the way they were built. And it's little things like that that I really enjoy, kind of exploring and having that access to the vault is just amazing. The the collection is just amazing. Yeah. No, and I mean that ties directly into what you were talking about with you know, exploring your direct ancestry and other living artists, but also those who have passed and um, those who continue to speak through their pottery uh, in the collections. Um, so that's really beautiful. Um, I guess one question to sort of kick off the conversation. Um, again, you've already touched on having this really deep, um, beautiful family lineage with both pottery and um, jewelry making. Uh, but could you maybe talk about, since you do come from a family of artists, what your first experience with clay was or your first experience with silver or metal? So I've been, well, I have jewelry and pottery on both sides of my family. And both my parents are metalsmiths, but only my father is a potter. So within Monica Silva's line, um, we actually lost pottery for two generations. Um, so I am the first one to kind of bring it back and reintroduce it into our family line. Um, I remember being at art shows as a child growing up. I was stuffed under the table, as many kids are. But it's one of those things where, you know, early on I learned to barter. I learned to talk to people to not be afraid to kind of come out of my shell. And it's, it's always interesting to see the kids who grew up in that lifestyle and how forward they are in the business aspect. And they're able to make pathways of their own and they're not worried about, well, the repercussions of speaking up and using their voice. Uh, it's, it's been really nice as far as pottery goes i didn't actually get into working with clay until i was much older it's i've been i was called to clay maybe about five or six years ago so i'm, I'm still i'm still really new to the journey it was I, I remember the first time like i really kind of found it uh me and my father were here in the studio and he was working on some pieces and he was at the time he was working on his polishing so he was burnishing pots and okay. he was struggling with it a little bit that night and so he turned and he was started working on some of his jewelry and he was soldering 
And while we were sitting there talking, he tells me, well, don't just sit there, do something. <laughs> and so oh, God, no. he, he gave me a couple of pots and gave me the slip, the polishing rock, and he showed me the process. And he's like, okay, go ahead and, and do it. And so we sat there talking and he was soldering and I was polishing and he turned around and he was like, did you just polish those? And I was like, yeah. And he said, you, you polished those just now while I was up there. It's like, yeah. He was like, you know, I think I, I think that's the way you need to go. And he's like, in that one explanation of me sh t telling you how to polish, he's like, you've surpassed me in the months that I've been doing this. He's like, that's not something that I can teach you. That's something that was already in your hands. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the turning point where I really started to focus more on the clay. And since then, I do a lot more. Or, uh, work with the silver and the clay together. Uh, one of the pieces that I did during the pandemic was actually the very first piece that I had entered of the clay and silver combination, and that one took first place at the Red Earth Art Show. So it's really exciting to see this kind of non-traditional way of creating jewelry and pop pottery pieces and a lot of the time my pieces will tend to be not just decorative but also functional so I'll have like a bowl that has a ring as a lid so you can pull the ring off and take the lid with you throughout the day and then when you come home you have a folder and it can sit on your shelf and be beautiful I love and nobody knows that it's a ring until you actually show them how do you see I mean I feel like many people who see pottery and see jewelry making, um, they visualize them as like two distinct mediums. Either you work in one or you work in the other, but you don't tend to blend those two. Um, do you remember how or why you thought, you know, these two should actually fit together and work together in a piece? Yeah, so I've seen other potters do do combinations of silver and pottery, like we have Eric Fender, who's also part of the collective, and I know he likes to do um, casted lids out of Tufa cast for his pots. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of other people that also will kind of do um, accents to their pots in silver. I wanted to, to combine my silver and my clay without... I wanted to do something different that was a little bit more my style. So <clears throat> the first one I made was right in the middle of the pandemic. The silver shops were closed. We were on quarantine in the Pueblo, so we couldn't go out and collect clay. It was one of those times where, you know, I, I understood what everyone talked about during the Great Depression when they didn't have material, when they started going and collecting the um, battery casings and they started using plastics as backings for inlay and kind of going along with that vein of thinking you know I, I had a, a couple of pieces of um, clay I had some bowls that didn't quite make it to the firing there was flaws in them and I was getting ready to melt them down and repurpose the clay and instead, I took that piece and I finished it imperfectly. And I took my silver and all the silver I did for that particular piece came out of my scrap bin. So they were all pieces that I had planned to melt down and to make into either sheet or wire ingot. And I made something. And I didn't really know where I was going with it. And then I had had the clay pieces they were fired down I had my silver kind of figured out where I was going and then I went through and I pulled the scrap pieces of inlay out of the cutter that and those are usually used for chip inlay because they're too small to use like for regular kind of style so it ended up being like maybe four inches tall it was sterling silver spiny oyster shell. I had like eight different types of turquoise in it. And then I had the pottery bowl, which is kind of flipped in the center. And that was what I ended up 
taking to the Red Earth Art Show in 2020. And that was the piece that won me my first blue ribbon. That's amazing. So That's such a that piece kind of like pushed me. Yeah, no, that is, that's really beautiful. Where is the piece now? I'm curious. So the piece is actually, um, I gifted it to my godparents in San Domingo Pueblo. So they have it in their home display. They're uh, collectors of pottery. So they tend to like the big pots that are really enormous in size. Uh -huh. And, but, but I felt that it like, it was super special to me and I wanted it to go somewhere where I knew it was, was going to be loved. And so I ended up taking it to them and they, they were so excited for me. And uh, I actually gifted them the Grounded in Clay book as well with that piece. Oh, that so they, they have it in the reflection room. That's so sweet. Um, I guess one other question I have, and it's sort of, um, I mean, you didn't necessarily talk about your inspirations when it came to creating this piece. It seems like with the pandemic, you just sort of dug deep and he used what you had and created something incredible. Um, but typically, I mean, what does inspire you when it comes to um, the work that you make? Um, I know your family lineage, definitely um, that concept of trace that you talked about a little bit earlier. Um, but what sort of gives you joy when you create? I'm kind of a little interesting when it comes to inspiration. I don't always take inspiration like from another artist or from like events. I tend to like pushing the boundaries of my medium. So how, how far can I push this metal until it snaps? Or how far can I push my clay until I'm starting to mess with like the shrinkage rates or getting too far? I'm stressing out the clay too far. Um, I think that I love when pieces fail. If I've pushed it too far and it does not come out, that is my favorite because then I know, oh, well, how did I get to there? Like, what is it that I did in this process that pushed it too far? And I think getting the opportunity to learn from every piece is really what inspires me the most. And I think that's also what's pushing my work in the direction that it's going. I know I really respect your um, sort of appreciation with failing because I think that is such a critical part of learning boundaries and learning, you know, where, where you want to go. If you take a step back from the failure, like you're right on the cusp of something really amazing. So no, I think that's really cool that you push yourself to that kind of limit and push the mediums to those sorts of limits. Um, are you ever, so you ever have like a, a precious kind of sentiment when you're working, you're always willing to sort of take things where they go. Yeah, like I'm, I always say, you know, because we do, the clay is living and we work with it in that sense, you know, maybe the shape that you're trying to form isn't what it wants to be. And I think having that sensitivity and knowing your clay body and knowing it's limits and knowing the boundaries of the clay itself it's really what allows you to work within it and figure out what you want to do right yeah it's respecting the clay itself and mm -hmm. but it'll show you where it wants to go or where it will break um no that makes so much sense to me um i suppose now we can kind of jump into the grounded in clay uh exhibition um, so you curated two works for the show, uh, a San Felipe cooking jar from the late 1800s um, and a dough bowl um, from 1920 to around 1940. Um, could you maybe talk about how you chose those two works? Because I know there are so many options in both collections. It was probably overwhelming. Yeah, so when we first came onto the project, me and my father, we're pretty familiar with the collection just being that we do work with our a lot we use um the potters that, that exhibition together 
and knowing what was in the in the collection and how small the San Felipe section is, we both knew that we were going to do a San Felipe pop. Gotcha. And I had originally planned to only do that one. And that particular cooking jar is, it's, it's one of my favorites. Like most of the time, anytime I visit, I tend to have them pull that one from the shelf just because it's so beautiful. It's so strong. It is mm -hmm. a pillar of a household. Um, to touch it, to feel it, to hear it kind of talk is something, it, it is just one of my favorite experiences. And so I knew automatically that that's what I was going to choose. So when we went in to go and make our final decision, I went up the whole drive to Santa Fe. I was like, I hope someone else didn't take it. I hope it's still there. Finger and I told my dad, I was like, you better not take that pot. <laughs> I'm going to sprint in before you. Yeah. And so um, we made our choices. And as we were leaving, they told us, oh, these were all the ones from the Vilcek. And like, if you had wanted to do another one, we also have access to this one. And then they'll bring it here. And I wasn't, I kind of didn't really look at them because I didn't plan on doing the second piece. And I, I was standing at the table and my dad was looking at them, getting excited. And then I just pointed at them, at the pictures. And I was like, that one right there, that one's mine. And they were like, what? I was like, that one, it's mine. It's my design. And so they picked it up and on the back of the picture was a handwritten note. And it was uh, from Robert Tenorio and he had, he had attributed that bowl to Monica Silva. So that kind of sealed the deal. I was like, oh yeah, I guess I'm taking that one too. I'm doing two of them. And so it was kind of one of those, I did not pick the second bowl. The second bowl made sure and picked me because there's really no, no other way to explain that. Mm -hmm. I know it's funny that you went in there knowing the one pot you were going to securely get. And then you were like cavalierly flipping through the photos and that one just... It took you, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's your family's pot. I mean, so that that particular piece came from the Vilcek Foundation. Um, so it had been in New York City for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. What was that experience like seeing it when it was finally brought back to New Mexico in the exhibition? So I actually got to see it when they first got to Santa Fe. Um, they were un unboxing them and I don't remember. It was, I was with my mom that day, and we happened to be in Santa Fe. And they called and they said, we have the dough bowl. It just got here. Would you like to see it? And like, you can take your own photos. That way you can do the write-up based on what you've seen and not necessarily just what we've provided you with. And so I was like, yes, let's go. And uh, I told my mom, I was like, we're going. And I don't, I don't think, you know, you always see, they always give you the dimensions of the vessels, like for pictures, but you don't really necessarily understand the size until you, it's sitting there in front of you and yeah. you get to see, like, oh, this is, this is quite a, quite a bit of clay. It's, it's big. And it's always it's always a treat to be able to handle Monica's pottery. Um, there's a couple of different pieces that are in the Pueblo that we do, like our neighbors, they own them. And so I do have access to like go and see them, but it's always nice getting reintroduced to one I haven't met yet. Yeah. Um, I, I do have one piece of hers that was part of my inheritance. So... Um, along with that piece, I also received her polishing stones and her book of the designs that she favored. That's so amazing. it's something super, super special to me. And a lot of the time, my designs are going to be coming out of that book. And I'll occasionally kind of add my own flair to it. But I tend to like using her designs 
on my clay body, my work. I just feel like, you know, the pottery that comes from my hands isn't, I, don't, I, I believe it comes from her. And so I use those designs as just a way to respect that I'm acknowledging that guidance. Yeah. And you still work from that design book today? You still create pottery mm -hmm. based on her work? Yes. That's really beautiful. Um, that actually also dovetails into a question from Olivia, um, who asks, if you're working on any projects that are inspired by or connected to your work as a curator for the exhibition? So I'm actually halfway through my senior thesis at the Institute of American Indian Arts. And I am actually a recipient of the Grounded in Clay uh, Community Grant. So the, the, the project I'm currently doing is I'm working with the Canon of Pueblo Pottery. So a, a lot of the writings that you have in general have been outside anthropologists, archaeologists that are going into the communities and they're writing about what they think is important iconography. And it's not done as much nowadays, but in the past, it was pretty much they wrote, wrote about what they thought was important. And, and in taking back what's ours, I've given one potter from each each of the 20 Pueblos a chance to provide a design that is either influential to them or is a symbol of their Pueblo. So it's going to be a 20 panel porcelain chandelier and it's going to be lit from the inside. Um, and currently, since I started school at IAIA, I've begun to experiment with alternative processes. Um, especially using specialized machinery. So my senior project, all the designs are going to be laser etched into my porcelain. And, and I chose to laser etch just to preserve the biography of every potter. So when they provide me with, with the design, uh, I scan it exactly as they provided it to me. And, and I don't clean up any of the images. I don't straighten out lines mm -hmm. and the purpose of that, that is because the laser will etch, will etch all of those little imperfections into the clay which is what I want, want it to happen because it's like taking the hand of the artist and they're making the design directly into the clay it's it's preserving the biography and the semiotics of each artist and so that that's my current big project. Oh, oh my gosh. I, I'm i like trying to visualize it. Um, but you said it's a uh, going to be in the form of a chandelier. Mm -hmm. So I use the term chandelier kind of loosely. It's actually going to be, it's not going to be tiered because, you know, as Pueblos, we're all one, we're all equal. There's none that's more important than the other. So it's going to be actually more of like a bowl shape so that we're all kind of on the same plane um i'm currently still in testing in the testing phase of working with the porcelain and i chose porcelain because of its transparent qualities and because i, I can use very very thin pieces whereas like an earthenware like a traditional clay it doesn't hold up as st structurally sound uh, the, and the porcelain took to the etching of the best out of the different clay bodies that I tried. Okay. Um, the one I'm using in particular is called Frost. It's uh, a porcelain that's produced by Laguna Clay. And Frost is very, it is a beautiful porcelain. Mm -hmm. It's very transparent. And so when in the, in the areas where I've the, in the areas where the design has been laser etched, that's actually brighter. So the light shines through those pieces easier. Wow. How, so you said you're about midway through your thesis now? Yes, so my, I will be finished January 27th. 
Oh, wow. That is coming so, up. <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit more than midway. Um, so IA has two different uh, senior shows. One is on campus in the Balzer Contemporary Edge Gallery. And one is at the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts in downtown Santa Fe. So the deadline to apply for the Mokna senior show is actually January 27th. So I have to be completely done so I can apply for that show. Wow. So but I'm just curious, I mean, be opening in the spring. it'll be opening in the spring, you said? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this concept sounds so beautiful and um, there's so many moving parts to it, it sounds like. Did you have this concept to begin with from the start or has it sort of shifted in iterations as you've worked through the medium itself? So as soon as I found out kind of like what senior projects entailed and how big of a project I mean this is your senior thesis you want to go big yeah as big as you can make it shine I yeah. Know, I yeah I and because I've done work with the collective and my work it, it all kind of goes together I knew I wanted to do something like this I wasn't sure exactly like how it was the end was going to look. I knew I wanted to do panels and I wanted to do 20 of them for each of the Pueblos mm -hmm. and SAR is actually, I went and we talked and I had a meeting there talking about kind of the finer nuances of like what I was trying to do and the importance of, of like getting rid of the tiered chandelier version and I started asking questions because I kind of wanted that if I did this what would the reaction of the museums be or I kind of wanted a bigger view on what I was trying to do and if my ideas were important or if I should have focused on something a little bit more or if there were pieces of it that I could kind of cut out and so that that was super helpful for me um, but going into this the hardest part has been getting the clay for testing we ran into a shortage of frost um for, for it, it took almost four months to get some in and so i was doing all my preliminary testing in a different porcelain clay body which it, it worked i was able to get like the laser the settings down and i was able to have everything ready for when I got my chosen clay body in so once that arrived in I was able to just switch over into the different clay body and I've never worked with frost porcelain before and it is it's stubborn mm. <laughs> but it's when you get when you figure it out it is so beautiful it, it is one of the it is one of the most stubborn and one of the most beautiful clays I've ever worked with no. commercially um but it's stubborn <laughs> <laughs> and one of the so going into before finals i had just tra transitioned from my my test panels which were three inches by four inches into the full size panel which is a seven by nine so it's going to be a pretty pretty big piece sizable um, yeah so when i made that transition i actually had to completely rethink how I'm going to etch them because the atmosphere inside of the laser was actually drying out my clay too fast. And so, okay. so <clears throat> I had to come up with a way to keep my clay moist without overburdening the laser with uh, too much stack in it. And so we actually, I brought my ideas to Craig Tompkins, who's the instructor for the Fab Lab on campus, and I was telling him where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. And from that, we act he actually helped me with a specialized tool that helps my clay maintain the moisture while still allowing it to have the full range of etching while inside the laser. And so, so it's been 
it's been a process. That is and so every, every kind of hurdle that we come through is so exciting because it's something new that we got to figure out and we got to get done. And I've really enjoyed the testing phases because, you know, we've never had anyone laser etch clay before. So it's not, not just that I'm working on a senior thesis, it's I'm doing work on, I'm doing work in clay that hasn't been done. I have to kind of make the trail and, I, and I'm taking down all this data so that it's something I can leave. That's a legacy I can leave behind on campus. Definitely. I mean, that wraps exactly into what you were talking about with constantly trying to like push the boundaries of the medium. I mean, that's precisely our senior thesis. I feel like you already did mm -hmm. it, even though you haven't completed it yet. <laughs> um, no, that is so cool. I'm really glad Olivia asked that question. Um, I did want to get into your studies at IAIA, um, but it seems like that is the best way to, to tackle that. Um, I guess one other question, um, I was curious if you experimented in any other forms or styles at IAIA, and clearly you have your etching, laser etching on clay. Um, anything else you've sort of discovered or learned along the way in your education process there? So going to IAIA has been, it's been interesting. Um, the first time I used commercial clay was actually on campus. I had never... I had never gone to New Mexico clay before. I had never used clay that I didn't dig out and process on my own. And so the learning about the different clay bodies, the difference between like an earthenware, a stoneware, a porcelain, and learning about the different glazes and how to mix them and how to throw on a wheel, it's, it's been very eye-opening. And I really enjoyed having the chance to learn processes and understand that oh this we do this this is something we we do at home like the difference between like an oxidation and a reduction firing and i'm like oh i i, I do that <laughs> now like i didn't know that's what it was called <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it's having that chance has been a real big eye-opener for me um I've also gotten to work in some of the other studios, like the jewelry studio. I've worked in painting, the fab lab. I didn't get a chance to do any printmaking, which I'm kind of sad about. Um, but just having access to the facility and everything that you can do on campus has been amazing. Yeah. I mean, I know you are deep in your senior thesis right now, but um, do you have any idea of what's going to be on the horizon for you once that show goes up? Hopefully, eventually, maybe next year, I will be a SAR fellow. <laughs> that would be so amazing. Are you going to apply? Eventually. Um, that's actually one of the things I really, I, I want to do fellowships. I want to further get a chance to investigate my work and I feel like that's kind of on the horizon for me and it's super exciting I know I say exciting a lot I just I get so excited about getting to talk about what I'm doing because it is exciting like I love having people ask me questions like can you explain to me about the laser is one of my best, my favorite. Like, why did you choose to do the laser? Is usually one of the biggest questions. Or, what made you think that you could even use clay in the laser? Mm -hmm. And getting those questions is it's always my favorite. Well, I also think it's so, so cool that you'll be able to sort of leave a guidebook for other folks that mm -hmm. I I want to experiment with pottery in the laser. Um, yeah, I think that's really neat that you're sort of not just doing your artwork, but you're also educating along the way, um, which is, yeah, which is pretty commendable. Um, I do know that we are about 10 minutes past when I said that we would cut off at uh, 6.30. Um, so I do want to be mindful of your time. 
Um, I guess one last question is if any of our viewers um, want to keep up to date with your artistic practice or um, keep learning about what you're doing and what kind of arts you're making, where can they find you? So I normally tell everyone just follow me on Instagram. It's just Monica Silva Lovato. Usually that's the most up-to-date place you can find me. You can always reach me by sending me a message. You can always send me an email, which is just my name as well, Monica Silva Lovato at gmail.com. Uh, I do have a website where it has like my artist bio and uh, artist statement and my CV on there. And that can be accessed through my Instagram page. The link is on my bio. And I go to art shows. So usually if you, you kind of walk around, I might be there. Uh, Sometimes I do, I can be found on the portal in Santa Fe on the Palace of the Governors. And then if anyone ever wants to come up to IAIA and do a quick tour of what I'm working on or see my workspace, that's always possible to get permission. <laughs> they can come find you and learn about the laser? Yeah. I'm like, I'm like the 90s. You just come find me. <laughs> You are there. Uh, well, this has been really awesome. I can just like feel the excitement that you feel for the kind of work that you do and the projects that you're working on. So that's been really fun for me to sort of pick up on virtually. Um, but thank you so much for taking the time and energy to um, talk to us about your role, both as a curator and as a, a working artist and student at IAI. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I've enjoyed this. Um, so for those who are watching, uh, just a reminder that Grounded in Clay, the spirit of Pueblo pottery, will be up on view at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe through May of 2023, and then it will travel nationally. Um, so this actually wraps up our SAR Artist Live series for 2022, and we look forward to relaunching next year. So thanks again, Monica. Be safe this yeah. winter. Right. You too. Have a good holiday. Happy holidays. Bye.